Welcome to episode 10. We finally made it, Mark, 10 of the Practice Squad podcast. Uh, not only to celebrate that, but also this is the best uh, week so far that both Mark and I have had for predictions. So, Mark, how are you feeling? Are we starting to figure out which teams are good or not, or did we just get lucky? Um, a little bit of both. I mean, you, I called it a few weeks ago. I said after, like, I think it was after the second week. I was like, we've seen the teams now. It's not just blindly guessing. I think I'm going to do better. And we've both, I think, done better. Um, I had a 12 and four week this week. You had a 10 and six week. It's pretty good. I mean, still not great, but it's pretty good. Hey, for, for when it comes to actually like predicting matchups, I'll take that. Um, definitely. I mean, we, we'd be going nuts if that was spreads, but you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with that for matchups. I think one thing that's helping too is like, not only are we starting to understand, you know, which teams are good, which teams aren't, obviously, but also like where each team's strengths and weaknesses kind of, you know, lie as well. And I think that's kind of a big part of it. Um, so, you know, for example, we had very strong feelings that the Cowboys defensive line was going to murder Carson Wentz for all four quarters. And that's exactly what we saw during that game was that man was running for his life. Um I need to pull up how many sacks uh, happened there, but I, I know it was quite a few. So um, they're third yeah, just, in the league. They're third in the league in total quarterback pressures. The Cowboys are. Got you. So, so yeah, I mean that's and you know we we've had this comment a few times, but like that most games in the NFL are won at, at line control. So if your defensive line is just absolutely mogging on an offensive line, you're going to be a decent team through the year. So yeah. look. As much as I hate the Cowboys and I hate how every single season we're like, oh, they might do something and they like, lose in the first uh, uh, week of the playoffs. That's like they, they look pretty strong in the NFC. I'm excited for for when they actually play the Eagles, because I think that's going to be a phenomenal test um, of, you know, kind of what the NFC East is looking like. Yeah. I, and listen, I mean, we we go back to, you know, you said it's, you know, we're starting to see the matchups and where there's weaknesses and strength in teams. And that's kind of how you and I both tend to pick these games. But, you know, sometimes you just have to not overthink it. Like you said, we both saw that matchup and we're like, hey, no brainer Dallas. You know, there's sometimes it's not as clear, but a lot of the times it's like, okay, this is such a clear mismatch in terms of their D-line versus that quarterback and offense. It's not like Dallas is a super team, but, you know, when they play a team like that with the strengths that Dallas has, it was kind of a no brainer for both of us to pick them. So um, Definitely. we're starting to see those more and more. And I think that's why the picks are doing better. Definitely. So uh, we're actually going to bring on our guest a little bit earlier for the show, because there are two, in my opinion, very pressing NFL topics that we need to talk about. Um, and, you know, who better to bring on than our friend, Joseph Engross, uh, to talk about mm -hmm. one, this, this lion Seahawks matchup. And then uh, two, Matthew Stafford kind of struggling with the Rams. Joe, how you doing, bud? What's up, boys? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Oh, wonderful. Um, so, yeah, so the first thing I want to get out of the way here is this might be the most frustrating season ever to be a Lions fan, and the statistics back that up. They are currently the number one offense in the NFL as far as points scored. Um, they also have Jer Jared Goff leads uh, touchdown passes, and Jamal Williams is a leader for rushing touchdowns. But... They have the 32nd defense in the NFL. And for that reason, they are one and three. Um, I've I've just been screaming at my TV for three weeks straight now, Joe. I'm sure you kind of feel the same way about it. Yeah, man. I mean, it's frustrating, to be honest with you. Um, all you just hear in the background is same old lions. People like Mark never changes. Um, just consistent all that good stuff. And honestly, I mean, what they're saying is it's not wrong. Um, I mean, coming into the year, I didn't have extremely high expectations, but I thought we would flirt with going over six and a half. Um, I thought we'd be anywhere from like seven to nine. And I still think there's a chance of it, but I mean, that last loss to the Seahawks just kind of dug our own grave the four weeks into the year, um, which sucks. But I mean, like you said, offensively, I thought the offense would be good. What Jared Goff is doing is just mind boggling. Um, I mean, he looks completely revived. He's, you could argue, having one of his best years that he's had in the NFL. And he had some good years the year that Rams went to the Super Bowl. Um, you could argue that he's playing better than Stafford right now, which is who he was traded for. Um, and then just 
even last week, we had so many people out down Swift, um, down your best receiver, Amon Ra. You still don't have Jameson Williams, who you've never even seen before, but he's arguably going to be your second best receiver when he comes out. You're down Chark. You're putting guys in Tom Kennedy, who came off the practice squad. Who He's, he's goaded. Thomas Kennedy's goaded. <laughs> he's he is, it. dude. Mr. Reliable. Like Third down, he's just catching passes and doing things that we – our starters don't even do sometimes. Um, so yeah, dude, it's frustrating. One and three sucks. Um, this week will be interesting. I don't think the Lions are completely dead simply in the fact that in today's NFL, you win playing offense. So I don't think the season's over, but I mean, if we're one and four going into the bye week, I don't want to say it's time to start tanking, but we could be in some big trouble. I mean, we could be the 29th worst defense in the league and we'd probably you know be three and one right now <laughs> i mean that's guys, that's the most frustrating part <laughs> john as bad as it is as bad as it is defensively like literally it doesn't get worse i mean you guys saw the stat i posted a tiktok of it four games through four games it's the most points allowed by any defense in nfl history through the first four games I, I, in the TikTok, I went on a, a kind of a riot about we need to fire the entire defensive staff. Dan Campbell, clearly a poor choice in hiring Aaron Glenn. I don't know how that guy was taking head coaching interviews. Um, it, it's not working, clearly. And, like, it doesn't take more than four games to realize that. And you can't even say it's because of a lack of personnel. I mean, they have some dudes on the defense. Maybe draft Aiden Hutchinson. Uh, Okuda's been playing better, although, by the way, DK kind of exposed him a few times in that game and man-to-man. But, you know, the issue really lies on bad defense, sure. Your offense is playing well enough to win games. The problem is when you mix bad defense with the horrible coaching decisions that we've seen. I mean, like, don't get it twisted. We, we're forgetting about the horrible co- – like, we should have three wins, two at the least. We lost two games, actually three games, because of coaching decisions and mismanaging timeouts and – you know, deciding to go for it and kick on side kicks in the wrong times and just not making the right coaching calls. Mix that with how bad our defense has been. And yeah, you're going to be one and three, you know? So like people can say it's, well, we're best offense, worst defense. That's why we're losing. It's also because of the coaching, you know, and you have to, there's plenty of examples we've talked about in previous episodes, but you, it's a bad combination. And you're asking the offense to do things that no offense can do when you mix the decisions that, Campbell's made mixed with the defensive errors and ask him to win football games. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm thoroughly impressed with Ben Johnson. And I think for how banged up they were against the Seahawks to put on that offensive performance, it's, it's clear to me that he was, he's a phenomenal coaching pick, but I couldn't agree more where no Aaron Glenn felt like a sound decision, you know, to hire his defensive coordinator. Again, he was taking head coaching interviews and stuff like that. They just can't put it together. Um, One thing that's really frustrating that I've seen a few different sports commentators talk about, and Mark, maybe you can shed more light on this as I uh, was not a wide receiver, a defensive back, was the fact that they are regularly like not playing too high safeties in in situations where like they 100 percent should be playing too high. It like. I understand to some degree that's a coaching error, but is there logic against that? Right. Like you're getting, you know, situations, uh, the, the Seahawks was brought up, you know, like they're, they're two and 14, three and 14, and we're not playing too high safeties. What's the point of, of not doing that, Mark? Can you kind of give me like an explanation as to like why that's happening? Well, there's two philosophies um, for, you know, if you have a single high safety, if you have a single high safety, there's a very good chance you're playing some kind of man-to-man defense or match defense, um, which obviously is asking your defensive backs to do a lot against the NFL, um, the NFL's receivers, especially when you have a, t- a guy like DK Metcalf on the other side of the ball. And you saw Okuda, as good as he's been, got exposed a couple times. It's almost impossible to ask him to play that guy one-on-one with no safety help over the top, which is what they were asking him to do several times. Um but the philosophy, John, is if you have one safety that allows you to bring another guy down and, and you'll be better against the run, that's the thought process of doing that. Now, in third and second and you know more than eight yards and it's obvious passing situations, the reason they're doing that is because they probably are going to bring pressure and play man-to-man behind it and force the quarterback to hold the ball and get a sack. Well, it doesn't work when you're not getting home, when you're not getting to the quarterback. Then it becomes a problem. Like when you blitz in the NFL and you don't get home, that's a bad, bad formula because the quarterbacks are going to pick you apart. I mean, those are the best quarterbacks in the league. 
they're super, super good against the blitz because you're not guarding the receivers with as many guys as you normally do. You see Tom Brady, you see all the hot throws that Mahomes and Herbert and all these guys make and Josh Allen. They just throw right through the pressure before you can even get to them. And Detroit's not getting home. They're not getting to the quarterback and we're not good enough to guard at the second level and not get home. So it's a terrible combination. And now what Aaron Glenn has to do is realize, hey, my philosophy of going after the quarterback isn't working. Maybe I should drop guys into coverage and just try to get home and hope Hutchinson or somebody gets home against a double team or, or makes one great play and just gets us a sack or forces the quarterback to throw into coverage. You're probably better off doing that, but he hasn't made that adjustment. And that's, I think, what you're hearing these analysts say is like, okay, you need to change something because clearly it's not working. Right. And and what's extra frustrating against that, too, is like the Seahawks really invested in their offensive line, too. And we, we talk about how big those matchups really matter for what you can do with your front seven based off of your line control. Right. And the defense is yet to really demonstrate that they're they're controlling the line. So for that reason, I feel like you probably logically would want to kind of pad your, your defensive backs and make sure they're not exposed the way that Okuda was trying to <laughs> go man against against DK that entire game. <laughs> it's a hard ask. Joe, I got to ask you, and this, you know, this leads us into the Stafford talk. I mean, I've been a Stafford hater his entire career. Oh, we right? know. Just Trust me. Respect, we get <laughs> respect, <laughs> respect that he's one of the toughest dudes in the league, and he's um, abs- absolutely one of the most talented quarterbacks in the league. But why I say this, and I say this all the time, that he's not great, is uh, obviously his problem with turning the ball over, throwing interceptions at horrible times in games. And he's done it his entire career. And normally guys learn from it after their first few years. He just seems to, you know, he plays like he's a rookie. He plays like he's a talented rookie, even in year whatever, 11 or 12 that he's in. Um, the question, I mean, are we winning this trade is the question. Is Detroit benefiting from this trade? as it stands right now, obviously Safford went and won the Super Bowl last year. And, you know, was he going to win a Super Bowl in Detroit that year? No, but are we winning the trade now? Because in Stafford and Goff, I mean, Goff is outplaying him this year. We're going to get a better trade, um, a better pick. I'm sorry, because of the Rams failures right now. Like, are we benefiting from this trade? Did we come out on top in the end? Are we going to be the ones sitting there saying, Hey, we, we made the right move here. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I still think it's too early to tell. I mean, you're four weeks into year two of the trade, you could say. Um, still have not seen the pick that is essentially JMO, Jamison Williams, which was a part of the Stafford deal. And then we're not going to see that second pick this upcoming year, that's the Rams' first rounder, until next year. And if we draft another injured player, it won't be till the following year. Um, but like you said, I mean, Goff's playing – good ball you could argue he's playing better than Stafford right now so right now right here you could say yes we won the trade simply because they were basically the exact same player in Detroit um Goff's putting up good stats he's putting us in position to win but we're just not winning um and you could argue that's basically what Stafford did whether they did it a different way Stafford would come back in the end versus Goff's kind of been more steady throughout you could argue they're doing the exact same thing and golf is doing it slightly better and more efficient. Do you think, do you think that golf is doing enough or I guess, what do you need to see from him? Let's say the lions to continue to struggle to win games, but their offense still is performing at a high level and he continues to perform at a high level. Is that enough to say we keep this guy long-term because isn't this his? Isn't this the year we have to decide on golf as as a franchise? So we have him till next year, and next year there's not really a lot of dead money on his deal. I think it was like ten million dollars, which in today's NFL, dead money for a quarterback, ten million is not much. But I mean, the way he's playing right now, I think we do try to throw money at him. I'm not saying the forty five, fifty million dollars like we can, but if you can get him high 30s right around 40 so he's not a top 10 paid quarterback but he's still up there to keep him happy I think you honestly do it um I mean the Rams just kind of proved it based off of your what you're saying with Stafford not being that good if you have a talented enough roster you're gonna win games um I don't think the Lions are gonna be bad enough this year to be in the top three to pick up Bryce Young or CJ Stroud so why not stick with golf? Why not keep putting pieces around it? He's proven through four games. Mind you, it's still too early. We got to wait to see how the year pans out. But through four games, he's proved 
he's good enough to get the job done. I mean, he's leading the league in points. If you put, like you guys said, if you put a competent defense, even if you put a bad defense, we're two and two, maybe three and one. If you're like ranked 25th instead of 32nd, we're probably two and two, maybe three and one. So, yeah, yeah, I do think he yeah. could potentially be our long-term answer as much as I hate to say that. I, I couldn't agree with you enough, Joe. Like right now with the way the Lions are playing, to me, the first four picks in the next draft should be defense, right? I'm seeing very little problem areas on offense. The biggest thing, honestly, would probably just maybe invest in your interior offensive line because they've been so injury prone. But even then, the replacement guys are doing just a, just a fine job keeping Goff protected and keeping the run game alive. So to me, it's like Goff isn't the problem. The offense isn't the problem. Why would you reach on a franchise quarterback when your your current guy you could probably pay, you know, to the tune of ten million dollars less, still keep him happy, still keep him productive, and then just make sure the defense that he's he's playing alongside isn't complete trash here. I uh, I rarely agree with Joe for those that don't know this, <laughs> but I actually agree with Joe here that he he's getting close to the point where it's like. You, it's hard to find a quarterback that can do what Goff's doing. Will he continue to do it is the big question mark. I don't think he will be able to continue to put the numbers he's been putting up. But even if he's a little bit below that, it's enough to maybe consider paying him uh, a decent amount of money to keep him here. Because to start all over with another rookie and do that whole thing or to try to find a different quarterback in free agency uh, is – not easy to do and not fun to do as a franchise. I mean, the consistency of, of golf and trusting in him, I, I hope he pulls it off and I hope he continues to play well and we keep him and then build around him. And like Joe said, exactly right. Like Stafford uh, is not the reason the Rams won the Super Bowl last year. You know, people can give him credit all they want. He, he managed the games and made just enough plays to keep them where they needed to be. Right. And he made tons and tons of mistakes and was covered up because his defense was so good and he had receivers that he was throwing the ball to making plays and a running game and a smart coach. Um, and it just worked out for them. Right. And sometimes that's what has to happen. You look at like previous Super Bowls. I mean, we, there's been some no, no name quarterbacks, guys that John doesn't even know what, who they are that have won Super Bowls at quarterback because of the teams around them. You know, I said Trent Dill for the other day and John goes, dude, who is that? <laughs> like, now I, I, I gotta say like that, where Stafford proved his worth to me that Goff couldn't have done was that Tampa game against Tom Brady. Cause I think truly like that was just peak Stafford of like your backs against the wall. Everything's going wrong. Like everybody around you is messing up and Stafford just like goes into like this absolute maniac mode where there is absolutely no way that anything in his path can stop him. We saw it a few times with the lions it, way too few of times based off of how much time he spent in Detroit. But like, I don't think that's a game that Garrett, Jared Goff would have won personally. I don't think he, yeah. he has that kind of skill set to just like, you know, turn into a crazy person and make sure that the game's won, <laughs> yeah. whether or not agree, he's man. dead on the other side of it or not. And at the I end agree. of the day, if you're putting Stafford and Goff, 1v1, who is a better quarterback? 10 out of 10 times you're going to pick Stafford. His arm talent's better. He's now has a Super Bowl. Like he's proven to be a better quarterback. But he's obviously very streaky. And Goff is doing the job that he's being asked to do. And honestly, he's doing it at a high level right now. Yeah. Uh, but one I, thing I do want to say that Mark was saying earlier that we disagree on, the one thing I, everyone needs to do is just slow their roll on the whole fire Dan Campbell, get rid of Aaron Glenn, Oh, Ben Johnson might be the only thing we have. We all need to just calm down with that. The whole Dan Campbell's losing us games. The whole, oh, we need to get rid of him immediately. He won three games last year and he's on pace to win two. Like, we all need to slow down because at the end of the day, in the NFL and most professional sports, you win with talent. And objectively, the Detroit Lions do not have a lot of talent. Mind you, do I agree with all of the decisions Dan Campbell has made? Probably not. Do I agree with a lot of decisions that NFL coaches are making every single week? Probably not. I.e. John Harbaugh last week going for it and not kicking a field goal to go up by three. Who his own player was like absolutely ready to murder him for. Yeah, the end of that game. exactly. And there's so many coaches <laughs> in the NFL today. One other one that sticks off in my eyes, Brandon Staley of the Chargers. The Chargers are so talented, yet that guy makes mind-boggling decisions every single week. 
he are he they basically missed the playoffs last year against the Raiders because he was making stupid decisions going for it when he shouldn't have. But one game in specific that Mark was going crazy on last week was Minnesota. I don't agree with Dan Campbell calling a timeout with 40 seconds, 50 seconds left, whatever it was, to give when Minnesota's you're just gonna go spike the ball and regroup. At the end of the day, we were up 10 points two times, and including in the fourth quarter. And on our last four drives, which, mind you, our offense is supposed to be the best thing, the best part of our uh, Lions game, we went punt, punt, turnover on downs, and missed field goal. So you had four offensive drives where you either could have not punted, kept going, continue your drive, take time off the, the clock. You could have. On the turnover, you could have made the play. I think it was, I don't even remember who it was. I think it was Hawk who was like dropped it or it was short. In the field goal, it is a six, it would have made it a six point game. Do I agree with that call? No, you went for it the entire game. Why are you not going for it now? It would have been the kicker's career long. But at the end of the day, you had four possessions in the fourth quarter, and we're going to put it on a guy calling a timeout 50 seconds left for them to regroup. Mind you, coming out of the timeout, our corners playing inside coverage when you clearly had outside blunt coverage. But at one time out in the fourth quarter has nothing to do with four offensive drives being stalled out in the most important time of the game. I will listen, valid points, but what I'll say to that, you know, and you used other coaches examples, you're right. Talent wins you games, especially at that level. But the thing is in the NFL is everybody's talented and the lions, I would say have, a much more talented roster than a lot of the teams that have two wins right now. And they have one win and three losses. Yes, because their defense is bad. Yes, because they've made some errors. They've thrown some interceptions, blah, blah, blah. But the coaching decisions in those moments, that's his job. As a head coach in the NFL, your job is to make the decisions off the field during the season and not in the off season. And then during the game, you have to manage the game manage the clock, use your timeouts, understand what your team needs in certain moments, understand when to go for it, when not to, when to go for two, when to punt. That's his job. Like he is the decision maker. He has the final say on all of that stuff. And he has shown from last year into this year early on, he struggles making the right decision in big time moments. And that is sometimes in the NFL, the margin of error. You look at how much, te- look at the scoreboard on this on this graph. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see a lot of these scores are won by less than six points, right? Those are the types of games that happen in the NFL because there is such high talent across the board. And the coaching and the game management is what's going to win you and win and lose you those games a lot of the time. Um, and I've seen enough out of Dan Campbell to know I don't think he has the capability of making the right decision consistently enough to win games at a high level. You know, there's a few times he's made lucky, you know, gutsy calls and it works for him. But other than that, man, a lot of bad decisions from last year into this year, and it's costing Detroit. And, you know, it's not even because the Lions are a bad team this year. Like, yeah, their defense has been piss poor, but they're losing games because of bad defensive play and not adjusting. And that's on coaches as well. And then, Game management, man. Game management. If they man, if they manage the game better, they have two wins at least, and that's with the worst defense in the league. So, I hear what you're saying. You know, I'm. I, I don't know if I'm being serious to fire Campbell, but Aaron Glenn for sure, for sure, be on the hot seat after. Like, that's the worst four game start in NFL history. I mean, it yeah. doesn't take. I, I struggle to defend like, Aaron Glenn a lot more than yeah. I struggle to defend Dan Campbell because, well, I think Dan Campbell has made some bonehead decisions. I also think that. Detroit's offense and really just this kind of revival of, you know, a team that actually cares to play for its coach. And I mean, Matt Patricia had his whole team against him within the end of year one. Right. And Campbell, that has not happened with. And to me, that says immediately that Campbell is a massive improvement on Patricia because these guys actually will run through a wall with him win or lose right now. But don't get me wrong. You need, even though Dan Campbell is, you know, Mr a grit kind of stone brain. And that's kind of like his entire personality is that he's kind of a meathead, but like that's where you kind of make sure you're making good decisions with your offensive and defensive coordinator to really be the brainy X behind that entire operation. Or, and hire people like, like Danny said last episode, Denver, uh, you know, they hired a guy that helps him manage clock and timeouts and, you know, in game, you know, when there's the pressures on and you're thinking about a million things, here's the thing. Some of the coaches and the head coaches in the league, call the defense or offense as well as manage the game. Campbell is literally 
only managing managing the game. He's not calling any offense. He's not running special teams. He's just a game manager and a leader. And he's listen. He does a great job. Guys buy into him. They they love him and play you know their hardest for him, and that's great. But if you can't manage the game, you can't be a head coach. He will be he will be an amazing special teams or tight ends or strength and conditioning coach for the rest of his career when he gets fired out of Detroit. He will be. But he's not, he can't be a head coach if he can't manage the game. It's as simple as that. It's as simple uh, as that. Joe, you, you hear Mark's word choice there when he, when he gets fired out of Detroit. He will be fired. He will be fired. Um, all right. Will be fired eventually, <laughs> right. Or, or chooses to move on to something else. Yeah. In the interest of time, I do want to quickly uh, move on to, to Rams 49ers while we have Joe here. Um, look, it, it Stafford definitely was not playing his best game. And to me, it's just like the 49ers just own the Rams, right? It's it's kind of that same dynamic that the Saints have had with the Bucks brady era, barring this most recent game where it's just they can't figure them out. No matter the, like scheme-wise, they can't figure them out. They play scared. They play nervous. It's just like, and, and man, I feel like Debo Samuel really had like his resurgence to let everybody know who's boss all over again, too. I mean, what an amazing player to watch. Uh, Joe, yeah. I, did you catch that game? Um, and I what did. were your thoughts? I did, yeah. Um, I mean, Debo, like you just said, is he's something else. I mean, that touchdown, I originally thought it was going to be an interception. And then he catches that, breaks that first tackle. And then Jalen Ramsey missed another tackle. And soon enough, he's just scored a 60 yard or whatever. But in terms of Rams and Stafford, I mean, you hear a lot of people on TV they're like, oh, they need OBJ. Oh, they're missing OBJ. Oh, Allen Robinson's legs are shot. Like, Jalen Ramsey's just getting dusted. Like, at the end of the day, it starts in the trenches, and their O-line is just piss poor. I mean, that's got to be arguably one of Stafford's worst O-lines. And let me tell you, in his 12 years or 11 years in Detroit, he had some bad O-lines. So they either got to get healthy, they got to make a move, they got to get Whitworth out of retirement and off of Thursday night football. They got to do something and they got to do something quickly or they're going to struggle. Like no matter how well Stafford plays, he's a very streaky player. He'll continue to throw dumb interceptions like the pick six he had this week against the Rams. But you got to you got to protect him or it's going to be a long season for the Rams. And frankly, as a Lions fan, we own their first round pick this year. So I'm about ready for the wheels to fall off down there out in L.A. And that'd be huge for us Lions if they somehow wheels fall off, end up in, I don't know, the pick 15 to 18 range. You're getting a top 15 player additionally to your own pick. Yeah, I mean, we, we got our happy story. Stafford got his ring. Everybody's all good. So now it's Rams tank season as far as I'm concerned. Let's, it's let's always get that been Rams. capital. It's always been Rams tank, man. Screw that stuff. <laughs> the Troy fans that root for that dude are so weird. Like we literally want them to lose it so that we're better and get better picks. But instead, because we blow so bad, we're rooting for Stafford. Listen, Joe, O-line is not great in L.A., but Matthew Stafford is playing horrendous. Okay, He has thrown more interceptions than touchdowns. I think he has like two touchdowns in the red zone so far this year, throwing the ball. Um, the simple fact is he's not playing to the standard that they need Matthew Stafford to play at. If he's as talented and as great as everybody thinks he is and gave him the credit last year that he deserved to, uh, to go and win the Super Bowl, you have to give him the same, you know, um, results, you know, the same stuff that he got last year for doing well. You have to give him the same stuff for how bad they are this year so far. And will they turn it around? Maybe, right? Like, I'm not going to just say Stafford's done, but he's been very, very bad in the first few games. And he's a large part of the reason that they've lost some of these games. Does the O-line help? No. But Stafford has performed better with, with bad O-lines his whole career. And some of these interceptions were not because he was under pressure. Some of these interceptions are just like, what are you doing? Throwing side-armed, not even looking at the coverage before he throws it, predetermining that he's going to go to cup. Like, all kinds of stuff that, like, high school quarterbacks do like just go through your progression do your job don't try to do too much and you'll be fine and he just he he struggles to do that and he struggles to kind of you know manage situations that pick six was so bad i mean pre-snap they knew it was coming still chose to throw it you can't do that they were driving to i think tie the game right it was a six point game at that point yeah I think yes. Mc, as he, when he walked off, you could see McVay be like, "Did you miss that? Like, what just?" Happened? Yeah, I mean, it's clear. And it, again, it's clearly a lot of that. You know, Stafford. I mean, two picks against uh, the Bills that we watched in that first game. Like, he's just not playing to the standard that they need him to play, especially with an O line that's taken a step back this year and losing Whitworth and some other guys. 
But, I mean, he still has a very talented roster, a very good defense on the other side. There's no reason that they should be struggling like they are with the dudes that they have on defense and with Cooper Cup and Allen Robinson and Higby, and two good running backs and a, and a great coach like McVay. I mean, it's he, a dream You won't even look at Robinson. And like, it's, it, well, dude, it's, he, I'm telling you, he's predetermining where he's going with the football. And that's it's, stuff. It's that, the same like, bad habit he had with Calvin Johnson. He, he can't it's like that. Two, that two other earlier. competent receivers. I saw a stat earlier that was – about receiver separation and Allen Robinson averaged, I forget the exact numbers, either like 1.1 or 1.3. And out of the receivers, they, were, they rated at this scale out of 144. He was 143 in separation out of 144. Yeah, so he I mean, either he's... clearly is, his legs are shot, he doesn't care, he's just lazy. Something's well, going on there. Yeah. And I'll say this too. I mean, you got to be careful with stat. Like they can be skewed. Like Allen Robinson's never been a, world-class like route runner or like guy like that who creates separation like a cop or Devonte adams does right. he's a new neut- he's a neutral ball go-getter like if you throw him the ball he doesn't have to have separation he's going to come down with it a lot of the time the problem is is they're not even giving him the chance to do that like they're just right. throwing it to cooper cup like that's it you know yeah. and listen as great as cup is you have to spread the ball around otherwise teams can start to do like what they did and jump routes and take them pick six. And like that changed that, that changed the entire game. And that basically put that game out of reach at that, at that particular time. And again, Stafford like is in control of those situations. There was no pressure on him in that moment. He just made an error. And there was a couple drop picks, by the way, in that game, yeah. the stuff that people don't talk about that he threw right to the defense. And again, wasn't under pressure. One of them was in the red zone again. And that kind of stuff just, you know, it can't happen. He's been in the league too long. He's, he's, he's got too much talent. He's been coached by so many different coaches and McVay is probably the best one he's had. There's no excuse for it at this point. He has to figure it out. It comes on his shoulders, just like last year when they were successful, he got a lot of the credit as well. When things aren't going well, he has to take responsibility and and he's got to make a change. Like that's their only choice. Otherwise they're going to struggle and Hey, we'll take it. I hope they struggle. I hope he continues to suck and we get the second overall pick. That'd yeah, great. I mean, at the end of the day, Stafford has a ring. He's elite when he's on. Yes, he throws dumb deci- or throws bad, has bad throws and makes dumb decisions. At the end of the day, he has a ring, and he's elite when he's on. But in other news, I'll give you guys three hot takes, and then I'll let you guys run with it. Um, I don't think the Bears win another game the rest of the year. I think that roster is awful. I think Fields could be all right, but the situation that they've thrown him in is just absolutely disastrous. I think the Cowboys are legit. That defense is disgusting. Um, I think they win that division. I get Hurts is going crazy over in Philly. They're 4-0. They're looking so good. They have, they're good in the trenches, both sides of the ball, arguably the best D-line and O-line in the league. But what Micah Parsons is doing is just insane. I mean, there's games where he's just taking over when he needs to every single time that he needs to take over. And, I mean, partially I've seen, like, I think it was week one or week two, there were a couple sacks that he had where he was just completely unblocked, which is just mind-boggling to me. Like, the fact that you're letting Micah Parsons run straight to the quarterback is just crazy. And then my third hot take that we can re-reevaluate at the end of the year is Lamar Jackson is not that good of a quarterback, and the Ravens will miss the playoffs. I mean, the the decisions that he makes on a week-in, week-out basis is just – like, he's almost guaranteed a dumb interception. You can talk about Stafford making dumb interceptions, but Lamar will just throw the worst passes, and you're just like, what just happened? And obviously, he makes some of the plays, whether it be with his feet or even some of his passes where you're like, damn, this is this guy's the real deal. But then there's also times where he could easily have four interceptions in a game and could lose you that game so quickly. Joe, man, you listen, I bring you on this show because I want to get in debate with you, but I agree with all three of those hot takes, yes, like sir. which almost never happens. It's like this is the <laughs> one time in the world me and Joe are getting along when it comes to this kind of stuff. And of course, it's when I wanted a heated debate. Like this guy just said three things that I agree. Right. And and by the way, Cooper Rush, best quarterback in that division. I'll just put that, I'll just put that out. There. I don't know about that, but I will say I do think that honestly, Dax Dax injury will help them. I mean, if anything, it helped them realize that they need to stop being so aggressive with Dak. 
just let him manage the game similar to what Cooper Rush throws. You need him to make six yeah. to eight, six to eight elite passes a game. And I yes. think Zach can do that. And then you run the ball with Zeke. You run the ball with Pollard, who's and probably play good defense. Yeah. And you play lockdown defense. Yeah. So I exactly. think that injury at the end of the year will be a good thing for the Cowboys. They got to stop letting, they have to stop trying to act like Dak is like a Mahomes or Josh Allen. They Correct. paid him like those guys, but he is not one of those guys. He's a, he will be a fine game manager and play him just like they played Cooper Rush. And they'll be Correct. very, very hard to beat. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say the only, take that I can see myself disagreeing with is that Lamar take and <laughs> man it's tough because I, I got in this argument with my dad the other day saying like man everybody says he's a bad passer I don't disagree or I don't agree like you know he's he can he's definitely competent and then he went and just compared his Lamar's playoff numbers with anybody else's playoff numbers as far as completion percentage goes touchdowns their own passing yards things like that and they're, they're pretty abysmal but he hasn't been in the playoffs in a couple of years now so hey we'll he, see what leads, he leads the league in touchdown passes right now which which is why Joe's take is pretty incredible to me but I agree with it because I've been saying this about Lamar for a while I, I listen he's great when he's great similar to Matthew Stafford he does things we've never seen before but when it's bad, it's bad. And Baltimore struggles playing from behind, which is another reason I think Joe could be onto something. They can't – these shootout games they get in where they have to throw the ball over and over and over again, that's why Baltimore struggled in the playoffs and struggled to win some of these big-time games. If they don't get an early lead in games – and I know this is weird because the Bills just came back and beat them in a, and they did get up early. But if they don't get up early in games, they struggle coming from behind and they struggle – to get any shootout type performances like with a Patrick Mahomes, with a Justin Herbert, with a Joe Burrow. Those are the guys he's going against the rest of his career if he stays in Baltimore. Yeah. He ain't he's not gonna go in and win many of those shootout games against those guys. I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. So I agree. Lamar, he, we've seen it. He's MVP Lamar right now. I see I can see him tanking pretty quickly and it, it could get ugly in Baltimore. Yeah. You know, that loss hurts and um their defense isn't as good as it used to be. They're in a tough division. Joe, 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 dropping some some bombs on here, <laughs> dropping some knowledge. And uh, just so everyone knows, all the listeners know, the guy who's tied with Lamar in most touchdown passes is uh, JG sixteen, Jared Goff out in Detroit, <laughs> leading us to a big win this weekend in New England. You don't, you don't, you, you don't even don't believe take that. Plus three, take the money line. You Do don't even believe that. I, before the show even started, he's on here saying, "I don't know." I, you know, I don't know if Zappi <laughs> starts. We're you losing. don't need the he's, points. He's all talk. Just take he's all line. talk. He's if all Bailey talk. Zappi is playing, the Lions could be in trouble. If Hoyer plays, you don't need the points. Lions money line. I think if Zappi crazy. plays, the team will rally around him. It'll give him a little boost of confidence. They'll be playing for the young guy, the rookie. Yo, oh, this is so fun. This is all fun and games. Detroit has no tape on Bailey Zappi besides the last half that he had in Green Bay. But if it's Hoyer, I don't think Hoyer's very good, nor do I think Zappi's good. But come on. Lions, money line, JG 16, taking us to the promised land. Hey, hey Joe, quick. With, with, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Last side note, you know, aside from all that, how is your Michigan State Spartans doing this oh year? My oh, goodness. God. That's another thing that people need to chill out with. Oh, the my God. Mel he's Tucker. An he's, an Mel Tucker. He's, like, he's an idiot, dude. He Overpaid. Stinks. Listen, they're bad, and there's no reason for them to be as bad as they are. Like, they're bad, and last year was a fluke, and he's going to end up getting fired before they win and have another season with seven wins. Yeah, Kenneth I, Walker literally had that entire offense carried on his him. back. Carried <laughs> him. Yeah, if anyone watching this show doesn't think Kenneth Walker's a good player, just look at Michigan State this year and then get back to me. <laughs> However, similar with Dan Campbell and Aaron Glenn, everyone relax. He still has top 20 recruiting classes. We were going to take a step back. Mind you, should it have been on pace to win four, five, six games this year? No. We were obviously going to take a step back from last year. But if you're bringing in a top 20 recruiting class, like next year, it's fine. It's going to take you two, three, four years to get an O-line of your own recruiting class because you're not sticking in freshman O-line in the Big Ten. Why is it a guaranteed guaranteed step back? You're returning your quarterback. You're returning your number one receiver, Blitnikoff Award um, preseason pick. You're returning a couple good running backs that you got in the transfer portal, and Elijah Collins has been there a while. 
you're returning some of your key defensive players, including you got a few great defensive transfers on the D line specifically. You returned. I mean, Henry- we had the worst. We had the worst deep pass defense in the NCAA last year in Division One FBS, whatever it was. So we didn't return anybody there, mind you. We did have a few good couple transfers. Um, Jacoby Winman from I believe UNLV. He's kind of panned out, and he's been pretty good. Our best defensive tackle, Jacob Slade, he's been out for a while. Um, like you said, Jaden Reed, the uh, receiver, he's been battling injuries. Like week two, he ran into like a bench and cut his back all up and has been having back issues. Um, I've been disappointed in Thorne. Like you said, we did return a quarterback. But at the end of the day, everyone relax. I'm going to put your face time. on a shirt and just it's going to say relax. Good. I need a Rod to come out. Um Another hot take for all those college football fans. I think Scotty Hazleton, Michigan State's defensive coordinator, will be back and will be okay in years to come. You're so patient. It's unbelievable. The one thing I'm not patient about is the Lions. And I do say, I was talking to my roommates about this. Um, If we're picking the top three, I think you get rid of everybody. This year? Yes. If you're picking the top three, you get rid of everybody. And I I live in Chicago and work with a lot of people in Chicago. And I say the same thing to them if they're on first year coaches, but I say if you're picking in the top three, you can Justin Fields. Like you get rid of him. He's clearly not the one. You get rid of them all. And same thing with Lions coaching staff. That's like that's borderline Hugh Jackson stuff. You're winning four games in today's NFL in two years. Every single year, there's one team that goes worst to first. The turnaround time in the NFL is not what it used to be. Look at the uh, Eagles. That's, that's a good point. With the, yeah, look at the Jags. Even yeah. I mean, the Jags are playing good ball right now. So coaching is very important. like coaching. Joe's had that point earlier that coaching is you know it's talent that wins. Yes, but like coaching is very important in the NFL. It is. It is. And so don't take like what I said out of um, what it meant. But at the end of the day, talent does win. So we need talent. We have our defense is horrible. And another thing, I'm not out on Hutch quite yet. He has looked horrible. Um, he showed a little bit of life, uh, week two against the commanders, but he even proved at Michigan, he needs help. He had a job on the other side of him who would get to the quarterback every time. These so, are so, these are all excuses, man. This is all, no, Joe, uh, you I'll, would have gotten a sack I'll against def- Carson Wentz on that, in that game. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll defend like, Hutchinson too and say that he, he also has a pretty high amount of quarterback pressures, which nobody talks about because pressures aren't as He's also getting double teamed. A ton. Yeah. Um, I'm 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 curious to see now that Josh Pascal's back this week, and I think he'll be playing not this week but next week. I'm curious to see what his dynamic brings to the defensive line. I mean that that's the other thing is like two guys that should be starting in that line are hurt right now. So Hutchinson yeah. is kind of just easy to isolate. So yeah. Um. Anyways, Joe, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, I'll make sure to take that Lions money line and tell you that you owe me money and. Uh, <laughs> And I'm excited to watch the Spartans suck for another few years, too. It's going to be great. Hey, Michigan fan. Party plus 26 and a half. Is my <laughs> God, you say the stupidest thing. <laughs> I don't know if we can ever bring this guy up. That's my other lock of the week. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Joe, you have a good one, buddy. Yeah, thanks, fellas. Go Lions. Oh. <laughs> man, that guy's an idiot. Holy cow. I think I think you complimented him, and he's like, all right, we got to stir the pot. As I much did. as we possibly I can actually here. agreed with that. I actually agreed with that clown quite a bit in this episode. But yeah, wow, well, that just means does. you're a clown. Well, I don't know. <laughs> he has some good points, but when it comes to the, the, the Lions and Stafford and some of these other things, Michigan State, he's just like delusional, you know? And we'll see. We'll see. I don't want to well, bash It's, it's better than just being a, a you know, a hater 24 7 like you Listen, are. Listen, I only things. hate because it's, it's what I have to do. If they start doing things the right way, I will give them their credit. But they haven't done things the right way since you and I have been born. So, and since far <laughs> before that. But let's get into these yeah. games. Let's go through a quicker recap. Yeah, we, we're, we're could... going to have to to speed run these because uh, we had a lot of good, interesting conversation with Joe For there. Sure. So, okay. So, quickly, the Dolphins, Bengals. Uh, I know this is kind of old news at this point, and the NFL has changed the concussion protocol. But, like, oh my God, they really wanted Tua to die there. Like, uh, just so irresponsible. Can't happen. It cannot it's, happen. It's, and everybody it's, agrees on it. It's and it's going to get uglier before it gets better because there's going to be all kinds of lawsuits and issues going on with that because it was pretty clear Tua should not have been playing in that game. 
I've never seen so much consensus on something with the exception of Deshaun Watson, basically yeah. that just yeah. the entire NFL fan base was like, yo, this guy's concussed. Are we sure he should be playing in this game? And sure yeah. enough, I mean, very, very scary situation. I'm happy that it wasn't worse than it was because like you know, second impact syndrome, repeat concussions in short time frame, very you know, it's dangerous. incredibly dangerous for the player. Yeah. So um, anyways, sad to see that happen. Hopefully he has a speedy recovery and, uh, that, the you know, the NFL and the NFL PA come together to have more responsible concussion protocol going forward. Um, Viking saints. I was really impressed with how Andy Dalton played, especially with a little bit of a banged up offense. Uh, I, me being a lions and a saints fan, uh, this has been just the worst season ever so far. Like just absolute fucking heart smashed over and over and over again it's just yeah, it's so be... bad so, sorry for the curse but like that's just how i feel at this <laughs> that's point. how bad it is dude yeah it, it we, really... might have to make, we might have to make this podcast explicit here pretty soon because i'm i'm holding back yeah it was it was back. not good like, it's just i'm in pain i'm in absolute yeah. pain <laughs> the vikings uh the vikings just kind of keep like you know squirting these wins out dude like it's just like how i don't how the think they're good like, like they I, are I they're, they're very talented either. but i i just don't think they're a team that can hold up yeah against case can I hold would up be, against the bills hold up against the like, eagles yeah they're gonna be a borderline playoff team uh we are we, t- we covered on the lions game i mean unbelievably high scoring yep. just terrible we, we don't even have to go into that anymore yep. uh, uh falcons pulling out a win against Cleveland. I don't think many people saw that coming, but the, the Falcons no. are two and two and, you know, are, I think they're still pretty bad. They're just, you know, again, it's the NFL Cleveland just seems to lose games like this all the time. Um, I felt so bad. weird picking them in my survivor pool too. I was like, ah, Cleveland or green Bay was kind of what I was juggling. Yeah. And I went with Cleveland and I regretted that decision, unfortunately, but yeah, mm-hmm. that was, that was an interesting game to watch. Um, you already kind of covered Cowboys commanders that uh, look, I, I hate the Cowboys. I take every opportunity to hate on the Cowboys. Their defense is legit. And you can't deny that. I mean, Cooper the front Rush. seven's ridiculous. And then you got Diggs back there holding it down and Cooper yeah, Rush, and man. Fi- fire up chips. Right. So, um, Titans Colts, uh, these are two teams that I feel like just don't have offensive lines in some ways. They're kind of the same team, right? Like they, I feel like they similar. Yeah. Like they thought they were going to have a good run game, but their offensive lines are too horrible to actually make that happen. Their quarterbacks are painfully average with painfully average receivers and their defenses are whatever. Like that's kind of how I see both of these teams. Uh, Very similar situation. Um, One of them will probably come away with, with the AFC South, but I don't think either of them are deserving it. That's kind of where I'm I'm sitting with it. And Hey, maybe the the, uh, Jacksonville Jaguars surprise us. Maybe. Yeah, I wouldn't count them out yet. I wouldn't count them out yet. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Joe's take that the Bears are – now that we've seen four games, I think I can confidently say that I believe the Bears are the worst team in the NFL. They're, their yeah, roster's think- horrible. Coaching's bad. Field's already given the new coaching staff attitude and making it about himself. I just – I, I don't, it's not. I don't. A, it's not a good situation there. It's you know. They're. I think they're probably the worst team in the league as well. The Giants. You know, one of the biggest surprises of the year so far. Like they, Saquon's back, performing at a high level. Daniel Jones doing just enough to win games. I still think he stinks, but they're. Uh, I mean, they're three and one, right? So they're doing okay. Look, I, I know we kind of wanted to do this game, though. Uh, I don't think the Giants are what they seem. I don't think their okay. defense is good enough to hold it down. I think their receiving core is horrible, and I think Daniel Jones is mediocre at best. Their offensive line has improved, and Saquon is is back to his prior form. That's going to look real good in the first half of the season. That's not going to look so good going into December, in my opinion. So there, right. there's so my take there. That's that's John's. It's not what it seems. That's a, a new topic we're going to be doing in some of our episodes. That leads me into my it's not what it seems. I don't think the Philadelphia Eagles are as good as what it seems, dude. They're the only undefeated team left. They've looked pretty impressive. They've, you know, they have the, all the pieces to be that team that can contend, but I just think – they're not. I think they're reaching their their peak right now. I think they're peaking right now. It's too early, and I think that some teams are going to start to figure out Jalen Hurts, figure out what they're trying to do offensively, and then he's going to struggle. And People defense, had very similar things to say about the Cardinals in the beginning right. of their season, and we saw how that ended up. So I will give you the benefit of the doubt there. You might be right. However, I just think their defensive and offensive line control is really, really good. 
I think their run game's a serious threat. And I think AJ Brown was that piece they were missing offensively to really have just a lot of command over the defenses they're playing against. I still think they're legit. I still think they're going to win the NFC East. Guess we'll find out. Side Um, note on that, John, side note real quick. And fantasy football, you know, we'll connect this to fantasy football was offered a trade this week, accepted it. And it's, it's going to, uh, the transaction is going to process tomorrow. Uh, I had Cooper cup was offered a trade by someone in my league. He gave me Eckler and AJ Brown for cup. And I thought that that was a pretty good trade in my favor. Um, just want to put that out there and maybe we can clip that and see what people think, because I think it's one of, one of the interesting, I, I talked to a few people about it before I accepted it. Wasn't sure what to do. We'll see what the people say. Um, Clip I it. Thought I, yeah, I thought I won that trade. Clip that. Clip that. Clip that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I think, and look, I mean, Coop, uh, Cooper Cup's incredibly consistent, but I just think, you know, that Axler it's has. It's two for the price of one, right? I mean, uh, that's kind of how I'm deal. seeing it. Yeah. You can't beat that deal with a stick. I mean, that's what I always say. Yeah, because um, the, the question is, who's your bench player underneath Cup, right? If right. you're getting an upgrade there, that's a no-brainer, yeah. in my opinion. So We go into the Jets, man. The New York J-E-T-S picked them. Um, shout out to Zach Wilson, the MILF hunter. He, he came in, and uh, I think he was hanging out with Kenny Pickett's mom after the game or something like that. You know, he you're, just, you're, Are you going to hit that one every single game? I have <laughs> to, dude. Listen, I mean, it's I'm, too good. It's I'm picking good. the Jets. You got to give me some credit there. I mean, they went into Pittsburgh, got the job done. Yep. Mitch clearly struggling. I think Pickett's getting the start this week too. I'm excited to see that. By the way, I'm really yeah, excited I, to see that. So I don't know. It's he. He didn't look bad. Threw a couple interceptions. I think he threw two or three interceptions. He, um, he had three interceptions, but I just think he had a lot of nerves. And one one yeah. statistic that was really interesting: zero passes that Kenny Pickett threw hit the ground. Yeah, I saw that. Every single one was caught or intercepted. Too. Yeah, <laughs> which hey, at least his, he throws a catchable ball. It was yeah. a really catchable ball. I'm I'm real excited about uh George Pickens fantasy stock because I picked him in both of my leagues. You know that I'm high on him. Maybe we can clip this one as well. That dude has been begging for the ball. He's been saying, I am open and Mitch can't get me the ball. We'll see if that changes with Kenny we'll Pickett. I'm excited we'll to see, see that happen. Um, Bill's Ravens, man, I feel horrible for how that turned out for the Ravens. That would have been such a huge win for them. Uh, but the fact that the Bills were able to to come back from that deficit and make it happen, I think it's a true testament of how good that team is. I, the, to I, do that yeah. against the Ravens is no joke. We touched on it too. Uh, the decision like for, for Harbaugh to not kick the field goal there, I actually kind of agree with it. And I, you know, his logic after the game makes sense to me. They basically said if we kick a field goal, we're basically guaranteeing to give Josh Allen the ball back and he's going to drive down and score and make us regret kicking that field goal. He said, so we're going to lose either way. If we don't score here, they're going to drive down and score. So by, by not getting it, you make it easier on them, but make no doubt about it. That's how good Josh Allen is, and that's what the coaches in the league think of him, that they're like, dude, we can't kick a field goal and go up three here with a minute left because you, Josh Allen – You Allen's can't give that, dude, score. any time. You can't no, give that what, – what was it in the uh, the uh, the AFC playoffs against KC? Yeah, Didn't they like, have like, like 30 seconds? Yeah, seconds. and then 12 seconds was enough for Mahomes. So let's yeah. keep it's, but it's um, that's I mean, it just give credit to the Bills. They're that good, and they finally won a close game, and they needed to do that. There was a monkey on their back. They got yeah. that figured out. They're going to be dangerous. My, they're sixteen and one. Sixteen and one. The Bills. We go into the Chargers. They're back without Boza. They're stewed. I think the Chargers are still. You know, I put them in my top four or five teams in the league. I know they had a bad loss um, to the Jags mm-hmm. the week before, but. I'm the Jags you, the are, a, look- are a sizable opinion. in my opinion. Yeah. I think the Chargers are still with it. Uh, we'll see how they kind of mitigate some of the injury issues they're dealing with and stuff like that. But Yeah, I, I mean, they're missing key guys, and they still won pretty handily. I know the Texans are pretty bad, but the Chargers are a very dangerous team, and I, I think it's going to be them and the Chiefs separating themselves in that division. Exciting race there. Uh, I was wrong about the Panthers and the, and the Cardinals. I'll give you credit, John. Kyler Murray. Got the best of his former teammate there, Baker. Baker looks horrible. Um, I hate to admit it because I like Baker and I like rooting for him. Uh, he's had that underdog thing his whole life, and I respect it. But he is really struggling. I know his team's not good. I, I know he's that in a pa- tough Panthers situation. fan base already hates him and doesn't I like mean, the he's, decision. Yeah, he, he's frustrating to watch, man. He's just not good. Um, yeah, I cannot good. believe honestly he's just really not delivering with the, with them the way that I thought he was, and you know, like. As much as I 
despise the way that things shook out with the Browns, I'm starting to understand their logic a little bit more. I still think yeah. it, the the deal they gave to Sean was disgusting yeah. and abysmal. I don't I don't think that should have happened the way that that did. But the logic of moving off of Baker, I'm starting to kind of come to grips with a little bit more. So that's maybe you know a change in yeah. opinion that I'm potentially having here. Um, the, pack, the Packers, uh, they're taking care of business. They're, the thing with the Packers is they're winning these games, John, and they don't look good. Like they're winning these games and like the chemistry with Rodgers and his, the rest of the offense is not it's good. Not it's, there, not, no. it's not there yet, but the thing is, think about when it is there and it will right. get there eventually. And, like, and potentially be, add Odell Beckham into the mix. I'm right. curious I mean, to see. they're going to be like, the, you know, listen, the Packers are definitely a team to watch there because they're three and one and they have not looked good yet. And they beat a few good teams. Uh, Patriots obviously missing Mac Jones and, and Hoyer getting hurt early, but give them credit. Good win. Three and one continue to, to work on, you know, work in the chemistry and they're going to be a team to watch as a contender. Yep. The Raiders. Uh, Danny. Got it done. No, we got, we got to call Danny. Danny. Sorry. Phone bud. Danny. Phone yep. Danny. Yeah. Missed yep. on this one, Danny. Um, the Raiders got it done. You the almost Broncos had us convinced stink. for a second, but the Raiders had the Broncos to win that stink, one. dude. The Bron- <laughs> I'm back. Listen, Danny made some good points last week, but I'm back. The Broncos stink. That's my opinion. Look, Russell Wilson. All I can say, there's a, there's a good, healthy argument between this entire Stafford golf trade. Who won that? Right now, Russell Wilson stinks, and Geno Smith is playing really well. And Geno we're Smith, four weeks in. Geno Smith right now is better than Russell Wilson this year. And yeah. it's not close. It's, it's not, not close. close. Right Absolutely This not year. Close. And until Russell Wilson does something about that, we're going to keep saying that. Uh, the Chiefs, Tom Brady, the trouble in paradise, him and Giselle. Uh, I'd like to just put a shout out there saying what's up to Giselle if they are having struggles. This I'm man single. literally chose the game over a supermodel, and I just – I have to respect that. I was, I, dude, this, that, he that dude is an ultra, ultra competitor, man. He Listen, he would choose football over anybody. Giselle, just know I would choose you over football. Uh I'll even give up this podcast if you hit me up. So just putting that out there. If you see yeah. this, Giselle. Or your practice squad pot, spot. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, with with that, though, I feel like Casey has just held on to the pain that Tampa inflicted on them all of this yeah. time and just had, like, every single part of this game planned out. That one dump pass that, that Pat had, Dude. I think in like what oh early, my. early in the second half was, no, I was, it was in the second, it was in the second quarter. Dude, my homes uh, played with a purpose, man. He had a chip. Or, on I meant second quarter. That, Sorry, yeah. second he had half. a chip in yeah. his shoulder in that game, dude. He, uh, he came out firing um, Tom Brady and the bucks are not the same team. We said this before the season started, you and I both agreed, you know, him missing the time. We weren't sure how serious the issues were going to be with Giselle. Obviously, like, it's obviously pretty serious. They just hired divorce lawyers. Like, yeah. it's pretty serious. And Look, you, you put any man through a divorce, even if it's Tom Brady. Dude, it's like, tough. This is your job, like, man. This is work. Yeah. If you're going through a divorce, you're not going to be paying attention. You're to not going to be paying attention. Like, there's things bigger than football, and your family's one of those things. And he, uh, I, obviously, I think they're actually going to get worse and worse because of this. Because that issue with his wife is not going to go yeah. away. It's going to be really hard. And then obviously, our, we we touched on the San Francisco game already, but they Stafford own the Rams. Blows. They own they, the Rams. Hey, it's not Jimmy even G, Stafford blows. Jimmy, they own Jimmy, the Rams. <laughs> Jimmy G seven and zero in the regular season against the Rams in his career. That is seven crazy. That's a crazy. He, and honestly, he, so happy he's back with the 49ers. They just look he like deserves that it. Team. Yeah, I just they love the way really, they really play good. I love hey, the way they're they back in the, the Niners are back in the contenders list for me, dude. They're back after that game. They looked really, really good. And it's not even to say that like the Rams are a good team. Like they beat up on the Rams and they showed that they can, they can beat you in plenty of different ways. Scary team. I would not want to see the 49ers in an early playoff matchup. That's Definitely. all I'm saying. Um, in case you guys can't tell, not only in the interest of time for this episode, but Mark and I are trying to pick up the pace a little bit, not as much on the game recaps. We think there's a lot to talk about there, but for the game predictions, we're going to try to speed run these because all we do is, is make fun of each other the following week about how right we were. (laughs) So (laughs) there's, there's really no point spending more time trying to speculate unless there's a hot take to be made. So Mark, I hope you got your keyboard ready to document and we can just kind of blow through these real quick. Yeah, if you right. want, John, John, you just go through each game, pick your winner, and just give like a quick reason why, and then I'll do the same after you. So yes, you just you do take it, and then I'll take and do all my picks. Sounds good. Colts, Broncos. I think Colts win this one uh, more so because I'm just really unimpressed with what the Broncos look like. I think it'd be really funny for them to lose Thursday night football, so I'm going to go Colts here. 
Um, okay, I'm gonna go. I thought you were gonna go all the way through, but I'll go with you. I'm gonna go with Got the Broncos. It. Actually, I'm gonna go with the Broncos. Uh, I think I don't know why they keep giving Russell Wilson primetime games. It's hilarious, but I think they're gonna stink. But they'll be just good enough to beat the Colts. Cool. Uh, sorry, I thought we were good. So you want me to run through every single game, and then you run through every single game. You can see we planned this. Uh, those watching, we we did a really good job. Other than yeah, yeah, just go through, just go through all your cool. picks and give your reasons, and then I'll give got my, it. And give my pick. Um, Giants, Packers, gotta go Packers here again. The Giants are just not it to me. Um, Steelers, Bills, I think that one's easy. It's gonna be Bills. Chargers, Browns, I would like to see the Chargers win that one. I know they're a little bit banged up still, but I think they're just a more talented team than the Browns, so I think they're going to make that happen. Texans, Texans, Jaguars, I know the Texans really need that win. I know they've really been looking for it, but I think the Jaguars are a much more legit team, and you know they, people shouldn't be blowing them off on their schedule. So, uh, yeah, I think the Jags are going to win that one. Bears, Vikings, got to be Vikings. Bears are horrible. Lions, Pats. I'm choosing not to hurt myself. I do think Lions traveling to to uh, you know Bill Belichick's domain. It's going to be tough just from a defensive standpoint. The defense can reel that offense in decently. It's going to be trouble for the Lions, knowing how horrible our defense is right now. So I'm going to go Pats here. It'd be hilarious if they ended up winning that one. Um, that that would be just my luck. Saints, Seahawks. I'm going to go Saints. If the Saints don't win this one, I'm probably going to cry on stream uh, like a lot. So. There's that. Um, Dolphins, Jets, it's got to be Dolphins. Um, even even with uh, Bridgewater potentially in play, I just think the Dolphins are that team. They, they look really, really good. They're definitely a threat in the AFC, uh, potentially deep playoff contender. Um, Falcons, Bucks, we're going to go Bucks there. Divisional game. Uh, yes, Brady's going through some stuff, but the Falcons are just not there. Titans, Commanders, I'm going to go Titans because Commanders stink. Uh, 49ers Panthers. I'm going to go 49ers because the Panthers stink. Uh, I'm going to say Eagles win this one against the Cardinals. This is a really good test for them, though. It's a good test for your theory, Mark. Did they, yeah. did they peak out? They're literally playing last year's version of themselves, right? Uh -huh. Exact same kind of situation. Really mobile quarterback. Lots of hype behind them. Explosive receiving core. We'll see what happens there. Um, see if Mark's prediction is correct. Cowboys Rams. Uh, man, Stafford's really struggled against good defenses. Um, so this one's tough, and I hate picking the Cowboys, but I think I'm going to go Cowboys here. Bengals-Ravens. This is a good divisional matchup. I think the Bengals are looking a lot better. They're starting to kind of figure things out, even with that horrible offensive line. So I think the Bengals are going to win this one. Um, and then Raiders-Chiefs. Man, this is a good one. I think I'm going to have to go Chiefs here. I just think they have it more figured out at this stage than the Raiders do. I still think the Raiders are um, – you know, potentially going to go on a run here. I still think they're a playoff team, but I just think the Chiefs have it more figured out at this point in time, right? More stable ship that they're they're driving here with with a lot of turnover and change happening for the Raiders. Mark, yeah, you're up. all right. I kind of agree with you um, on most of these picks, but we'll see how this goes. Uh, so I'm going with Denver, obviously, in that first game against the Colts. Um, I just think that you know Russell Wilson is going to have just enough over Matt Ryan to get that one done. Uh, obviously, the next game, I'm going to go with the Packers. I think, like John said, the Giants are pretenders. I completely agree. Um, the Packers are a team that's going to continue to get better throughout the year, and they're going to be harder and harder to beat each game they play. Um, I'm going to go with Buffalo, 16-1. and one. That's all it needs to be said. Josh Allen, MVP. I'm going to go with the Chargers in the next game. They're really starting to you know, figure it out, and I think that they got that one bad loss out of the way. The, the Chargers could go on a winning streak here uh, upwards of you know, six, seven games in a row and uh, be a dangerous team to compete with the Chiefs in that division. Um, Texans-Jags, I'm going to go with the Jags. Uh, I, I do think they're better than people are giving them credit for. The Texans are truly pretty bad, and Trevor Lawrence is starting to figure out with Doug Peterson, the quarterback whisperer. Uh, Vikings-Bears. Shout out to Joe Spangros. Bears might not win another game, and they're surely not going to win this one. I'm going to go with the Vikings winning at home. Detroit in New England. I don't care who plays quarterback. I think I think John could play quarterback for the Patriots on, on Sunday, and they're beating Detroit. They're going to run the ball every single play right down Detroit's throat, and it, you hit them with a few play actions with whoever's at quarterback and make easy completions. Detroit's not going to – listen, they're not going to solve their problems in one week. New England's going to figure it out and bounce back and get a win. Um, I'm actually going to go with Seattle to beat the Saints. I don't know what's going on in New Orleans, but they're struggling. And I don't want to talk about it. 
there's there's <laughs> there's, there's just errors all over the place. Jameis is clearly not the answer. Andy Dalton, you know, I don't know how much of a step up that is. Red Rocket, baby. Let's Geno go. Geno Smith, Geno Smith in Seattle and their ability to run the ball and play, you know, some decent defense. Even the last week, they gave up a ton of points to Detroit. But I'm gonna go to Seattle. Uh, I'm gonna go with the Jets Jets to beat Miami without Tua, and I just don't think that Miami's the same team. The Jets are are a better team than people think they are. They have weapons around Zach Wilson. They've built around him. He's he's in a growth year this year. Um, he's definitely matured, some could say, this offseason. Hey, hey, but, look, Dolphins coming from Florida, right? You got a lot of 40-year-old women. Listen, <laughs> listen, I'm going with the Jets. He might be pumped up. He might be fired up. You're right. I'm going with the Jets to win it at home. I, I just think they're better than people think they are. <laughs> Um, speaking of 40 year olds, I'm going with Tom Brady to beat the Falcons because Tom Brady coming off of a loss and coming off of, of a divorce week, I sure as hell wouldn't want to see that guy in hell. All right. It's not somebody I'd want to see. So Tom Brady against Atlanta, he might take all that frustration out on those poor Falcons. And I don't know, a Falcons might go extinct after Sunday. Okay. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, Tennessee, Tennessee and Washington. No brainer, Carson Wentz. If he's your quarterback, you're not going to win another football game. Uh, like he's, they're upwards of as bad as the Bears are. Um, Titans. Uh, San Francisco is going to smack Baker Mayfield in in uh, Carolina. It's not even going to be close. 49ers are starting to figure it out, and they're going to come out and absolutely have every answer defensively. Baker's going to struggle. This might be the week Baker gets benched. By the way, San Francisco for sure. I'm actually going to go with the Cardinals to beat Philly this week and give them their first loss. Why? I can't really give you a sure reason as to why. I just have a feeling that Kyler Murray and, and Kingsbury are going to have a good game plan this week at home. They're 2-2. Two and two. They're right on that borderline of like, hey, are we going to be good or are we going to be bad? Because they've shown both good and bad things. And the Eagles, everything's gone so smooth for them. It just seems like this is the week I think it starts to fall apart a little bit. It's not going to be a blowout win, but they'll get the job done probably on like a you know three- or four-point game. Uh, I'm going to go with the Rams. I originally was going to agree with John and say Dallas because of their pass rush and because Stafford will struggle with that defense and probably throw a couple interceptions. I still think he throws those interceptions and struggles, but I think that Cooper Rush or Dak or whoever plays is going to struggle against that Rams D-line, and I think the Rams are pissed off right now, and I wouldn't want to see Aaron Donald in hell pissed off either. So I'm going to go with the Rams to beat Dallas. I think Dallas is good, but I don't think they're as good as people are saying they are. Um, Rams get get a bounce back win. Cincy, I think, is going to go into Baltimore and win. They're starting to figure it out passing-wise. Joe Mixon's starting to figure out. The Bengals' defense is getting better. Lamar, shout out to Joe Spangos again, going to start to have his downfall here this season. He think I think he's reached his high this year so far. I think it's going to start to decrease and come back down to reality. Uh, Reaching Bengals, his high at two and two, really. Man, two, no, I'm these are starting to get late. In terms of his play, in terms of his right. play, I mean, he leads right. the league. In t- he's the MVP leader right now, probably, uh, or he's up there. And I think it starts to fall apart for him individually, which is going to cause them to lose this week. Joe Burrow is going to step up and have a big week. Sure. And then the last game, I'm going to go with the Chiefs. They looked really, really good um, against Tom Brady and them. I will say this. The Raiders always give the Chiefs issues. Derek Carr always has these shootout games with, Mahomes, I think that's going to be the same thing on this primetime game. I'm, I'm expecting a shootout game. Devontae Adams uh, is going to have a big game, but I think Mahomes and the Chiefs get it done, and they, I think they actually come back from behind and beat Vegas on Monday night. Big, big, big. All right, one last thing, because I, I forgot. Was it 50 subscribers or 100 subscribers that you'll you'll buy a podcast microphone? 100 subscribers. Okay, so here you have it documented. I think we said this off air last time. If we get 100 subscribers, Mark will stop using his AirPods and actually get a podcast microphone like professional. Keep in mind, th- this guy doesn't pay rent anywhere. He's got a nice paying job, right? He's got a degree. He's working hard out there. And he's a cheapskate that won't buy a podcast microphone for something that he does once a week and spends a lot of time tweeting and posting on social media about. Why? Because he's a scrub. So let's let's get us to 100 subscribers here so I don't have to listen to this dude's AirPod quality all the time for the rest of my life. Thank you. Mark, any uh, other comments before we wrap this episode up? No, I can I can just say that I have my jersey ready for you if Detroit continues to struggle. And I think there's ACTs, I think it's in July around, around here at least. I don't know about where you're at, but 
just start to study a little bit. I'm hoping that you can get above a 25 and, um, you know, I, I just, my jersey is going to look good. I, I can send it in the mail to you. You sure. wear it. I, I, I'm going to hire, I think I'm going to hire someone to follow you and just film the whole thing and just take the ACT and just, you know, not take the ACT, just have a hidden camera on his hat or something, or have like a goggles, like I Carly, like Freddie Benson used to do. Yeah. I, that's what I need to happen. So just start to think about that mentally. Yeah. That's a, no, you know, I'll definitely dust off the old books there, you know, no, nothing I'm not used to. Maybe I can beat my score from high school, right? That, who knows? That's, that's right? Something, do some good right. things for put that on your next job app. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, also, one potential hurdle that I, I thought of, uh, I don't know if there's an age limit to taking the ACT, but if there is, I'll just take the GRE. So, okay. you know, same, same concept. Just, just kind of want to let I don't you think know. Th I can't think there'd be an age limit, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, age. yeah, if, if, you'll, if you'll give them their money, I'm sure they'll take it. For if you sure. want to pay and so. take ACT, what are they going to do, say no to you? I mean, that'd be... Especially if you're wearing a, a Central Michigan number 13 jersey. Right. I mean, yeah, the Proctor's going to be like, oh, fire up chips. Yeah, I was a really huge Mark Petrito fan. I'm a really totally. big fan of, of MAC 10 holders. And yeah, and that's <laughs> they're going to they're gonna be like, hey, that dude, that dude <laughs> held the hell out of the ball. You can take this. You'll, you'll take the ACT for free. He might give you a perfect score. That's the key. High school students that are studying. Make sure to to wear your your Mac jerseys uh, to, to your ACT, and the proctor there will make sure to give you a perfect score. It will rig it in your favor. You heard it here first on the Practice Squad podcast. Until next week, see ya.